Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Miguel. Thank you to the organizers. And thank to you all, thanks to you all for coming out here uh, tonight. I know uh, there's been a lot of learning today. Uh, just uh, so you know, with two minutes left in the second quarter, it's Michigan 17, uh, Notre Dame 0. So I know, right. This is like fantasy tonight. So. Um, Mucosal helium Crohn's disease, that's kind of strange, right? We always talk about ulcerative colitis and then we kind of shrug our shoulders about Crohn's disease. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to move to the next slide first by pushing this green button, which has not moved the slides. Maybe I'll like will it. Change slides, please. There we go. You can go to the next one. Okay. There we go. Okay, so you remember the good old days? Right? Black and white TV, rotary phones, little antennae on the top of your TV. Well, for many years uh, in Crohn's disease, we actually had goals of therapy that were here. They basically met, got someone better, induced remission, kept them better, maintained remission, didn't screw up, i.e. prevent complications, right? Make them feel better, quality of life, and then you limit surgery, right? Because the patient's always like, well, surgery's the last option. Um, not, we're not talking about that right now, but nevertheless, you kind of limit surgery, and that was it. That's how, we, that's how I trained, that's how Miguel trained, that's how most of the people here trained. And the question is, how well did that really turn out? Well, let's look at the data. So here's the data, and it's not good. If you look at this study from Binder, and this was from 1985, this shows that relapse, uh, patients uh, relapse with Crohn's disease within one year, up, up to f almost 40% relapse, within three years, 80% relapse, and at 10 years out, their study showed 99% of their patients had at least one relapse. And they required surgery. So following the curve, if you look at the blue, which is um, one surgery, 10 years out, over, about 55% of patients had one surgery, about 40% of patients had a second surgery. Okay, fine, you said, well, you know, a lot of patients with Crohn's need surgery, and shine, you took out the bad part, and now, now everything's okay. Well, they, Crohn's comes back after surgery. So this slide, the orange is radiographic or endoscopic recurrence, and the blue is symptomatic recurrence, and you can see that at three years, 75% of patients had endoscopic recurrence, uh, and about half of them had symptoms. And following out, um, it went up to about 85%. So Crohn's came back after surgery, okay? So basically, how were, how were we doing in the good old days, right? Well, we had a 5 to 20% recurrence rate each year. We had reappearance of endoscopic lesions, three quarters or more of the patients within a year after surgery. From Rickert's studies, you just took a scope in, 85% of patients had recurrent disease within one year of surgery. Okay, most patients relapsed, about two-thirds perhaps within three years. And in 10 years, 50% had reoperation. So the question uh, I ask you is why does this advance not work? But the other question I ask you is, is, is that really uh, the best that we can do? Because this is where we've been stuck up until recently. So modern treatment paradigms have added mucosal healing as an endpoint. The only thing I changed on this slide is in red. Isn't that nice of me? I made, you, don't have to, you don't have to read them all. Just, they stuck the red one in there. I made it red. It wasn't red when I first got the slide. I made it red. I took the liberty. Healing in mucosa has been added to change the course that we've all suffered through with our patients. But this isn't ulcerative colitis. You can't just do a flex sig. How do you measure mucosal healing and Crohn's disease? Well, there are a few mucosal healing scales uh, that are validated. The first one is the CDEIS. Does anyone use the CDEIS? I certainly hope not. Well, actually, one of our faculty does. He's Japanese, and he, he does it, uh, that or the CES CD on all the patients. And I can't read the reports because they're calculated in every single one. But basically, you get points or negative points for deep ulcerations, superficial ulcerations, how much of the surface is affected by the disease or by ulcers. Uh, while it is the gold standard and validated, it takes a lot of time, and it's not practical for clinical use, using clinical trials. Or the second one, the CES, 
this simple endoscopic scores for Crohn's disease, a little different, of course. Why should it be the same? That way I have to learn multiple scales. Uh, presence of ulcers, ulcerated surface, affected surface, narrowings, ooh, uh, and affected segments, a little easier, but still very time consuming. Um, and, uh, and then it, for post-operative occurrence, it's much easier. The Rookert scale, any, any of you use the Rookert scale for post-operative? Right, a few hands went up. Uh, exactly, it's uh, re recurrence, and it's really from people who had ileal cecal resections or ileal, ileal resections. Uh, it's recurrence in the small bowel. It's actually not recurrence in the colon. So many of you wonder, well, what about using some of the markers of inflammation, the non-invasive ones that we have? CRP, fecal calprotectin, fecal lactoferrin. Well, what's the data in Crohn's disease? Well, for this, um, I, I, instead of showing you 17 slides, I'm showing you um, one slide. Uh, CRP, the data for Crohn's, is not that great. Look at um, the, sen well, this is IBD. The sensitivity is only 0 0.49, okay? So that means that it's not a very sensitive. You really want your sensitivities and specificities to be over 85 and this is point at 49. Specificity is pretty good. Um, the calprotectin does better. If you look um, for IBD, Crohn's, or UC, the sensitivities are up in the 85 to 90 range. The specificity, though, not so good for Crohn's. You're down below 70 um, at 0.67. Uh, so uh, it suggests that while they had some value with the calprotectin, lactoferrin's performance was not better. Um, it's still um, particularly for Crohn's disease, not that helpful. So many people then say, well, wait a minute, what about Crohn's of the small bowel versus Crohn's of the colon? We can use the calprotectin for the colon, but not for the small bowel because we use calprotectin for ulcerative colitis. So what about the small bowel? Well, this study from Japan, well, what they did is they did, uh, this is patients with small bowel Crohn's, they did a um, double balloon enteroscopy on all the patients because this was Japan. And uh, those who had strictures that they couldn't get past, they did the CT enterography on. So that's how they documented active disease in the small bowel and then correlated it with fecal calprotectin. And look at the box at the bottom. Um, you can see the sensitivity still 83% and the specificity a little better than, than before, but still in the low 70s. So, so still the fecal calprotectin is, is not not great. So many people challenge us. They say, well, for Crohn's disease, do we really have convincing data that mucosal healing matters? It's not a mucosal disease. It's transmural. And just because your mucosa is healed, maybe that doesn't mean anything. Maybe it does. After all, this is an ulcerative colitis where it's a mucosal disease. So I got, I got the much harder lecture. You're, you're doing the ulcerative colitis one? Oh, so yeah, the course director gives me the Crohn's one. I gotta like stumble through it, you know, and then he's just gonna go up there and show pictures on his sigmoidoscopy. He said, oh, look how easy it is. So what about Crohn's? Does healing matter? Well, and this, and this slide is a very famous. So this correlation, this showed the likelihood that I had in college of actually getting a date, and it was very, very poor, okay? What it showed is that um, the Crohn's disease activity index on the y-axis and the Crohn's disease endoscopic index of severity on the x-axis, very poor correlation. The dots are, are all over the place. Um, and yeah, I'm still recovering from that. However, we do have some interesting data. This is, this is important. This study was before we had biologics. It was published in 2007, but the data was from before biologics. And what this showed, that if you uh, patients who treated for Crohn's disease and did a colonoscopy, and it was about an average of about seven months after starting treatment, those who had mucosal healing within that first year, the top bar, and then you followed out the likelihood of surgery, you can see that all, over five to six years, if you had mucosal healing within that first year, only about 10% of you went to surgery six years out. But if you didn't have mucosal healing within that first year, you can see the surgical rate was about 30%. So just getting the, um, within the first year of presenting for a diagnosis, healing the mucosa does show a huge difference. Look at that difference over time with patients requiring surgery. And, and you could argue that surgery is a good marker for success in Crohn's disease given the way that, that Crohn's has been treated. This is a slightly different study. 
What this looked at is this get, is looked at patients who got, who received infliximab um, therapy. And the, what you're looking at is, is sustained clinical benefit. The patients who had infliximab therapy and healed within the first six to seven months or so are in blue. The ones who are in orange did not have mucosal healing. And again, we're looking out now five, six, seven years. Look at the difference between patients who within the first six to 12 months healed on infliximab in blue with a sustained clinical um, uh, benefit versus those who did not heal. So previously I showed you surgery as an endpoint. Now I'm showing you sustained clinical benefit as an endpoint with mucosal healing early making a big difference. Because people say, how do we know we're changing the natural course of disease? Look at the, what these, these what the slides are showing you. And in fact, sometimes you'll say, well, what if you're not completely healed? Well, this suggested the same study that whether you completely healed or partially healed, you were still a lot better off than no, no mucosal healing at all. Although some of the other data I'm going to show you suggests that you really want complete muc mucosal healing. But there were different studies. This is the ACCENT trial. The ACCENT trial was an infliximab versus placebo trial. Pay, everyone got an initial infusion, and then those who responded went on to receive the rest of the induction and then maintenance with drug or placebo. Uh, so while some of these patients did have placebo, the point is that this is looking at, on the left, hospitalizations, and on the right, surgery, Crohn's surgeries. So on the, the people in yellow had no mucosal healing. They were scoped before the study at week 10 and week 54. So if you had no healing uh, in this trial, most of the patients either had infliximab or placebo, you can see that 46 of 100 patients were hospitalized and eight um, had surgery. If you had healing at either week 10 or week 54, the orange bar, you can see that you nearly, nearly half the um, hospitalizations and there were no um, surgeries, and if you were healed at both weeks 10 and 54, the gray bar, well, there is no gray bar because it was zero for all of them. So patients who healed in the ACCENT trial, especially if they healed by week 10 and stayed healed, had no hospitalizations and no surgeries. And remember, those of you who know me, I do, uh, or at least uh, sometimes do economic studies, and people say, well, what about the cost of the medicine? Well, you know how much surgery and hospitalizations cost? Okay, so by using therapies that work in heal mucosa, you're actually decreasing hospitalizations and surgeries. There's also studies showing better quality of life. Uh, patients with active Crohn's in some of these studies were shown to be on disability 16 to 25 percent of the time. So about over 10 years ago now, we had the top-down study. Remember that top-down versus bottom-up? And everyone's like, do you, do you practice top-down? It's almost like a little question in the bar. It's like, you know, are you a top-downer? And <laughs> it's like, I don't know why I should answer that question. My mom's sitting next to me. But nevertheless, um, so the top-down trial, patients who really were never treated with anything serious for their Crohn's, were randomized to get three doses of infliximab, 026, as well as azathioprine, 2.5 mg per kg. They got subsequent infliximab if they flared. Otherwise, they didn't, because it was done in Europe, and, and they didn't have maintenance indication back then. Or they got the usual course that we all did. Steroids, 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 azathioprine, maximize azathioprine, finally earning infliximab. So many of you are familiar with the data on the left. The yellow are those who went to the steroid route that we all used to do. The blue are those who started right off the bat, uh, moderate to severe Crohn's, with infliximab. And you can see um, remission in one year was much better but look to the right. This is two years out, complete endoscopic healing, complete endoscopic healing, two years out. Look at that difference, 73% versus 30%. Have you ever seen such a big difference? In, in, we, we, any of you in the symposium that was next door before this one, did they have a, such a big difference? Uh, Eco, you were there, weren't you? Did they have such a big difference in their, no, they didn't, exactly. So that's a, that's a big deal, okay? 70 3% of the patients completely healed. They weren't even all on infliximab still. In fact, this, uh, the Belgian group, um, Gert Dons and then Philippe Bert, uh, Bert, showed that if you actually had complete endoscopic healing in blue, okay, two years out, okay, the remission off steroids, 
71% versus those who had some endoscopic inflammation. And then look at the right side. They actually had patients who weren't even on their anti-TNF anymore. Those who had the um, simple endoscopic score of zero were able to be off steroids and off their TNF two years out. Deep remission. So all this suggests that healing the mucosa actually does make a difference in Crohn's. The STRIDE organization, this may be one of those pre-test questions that you had, of experts of inflammatory bowel disease. In fact, it's the International Organization for Inflammatory Bowel Disease. For Crohn's disease, they are said that your treatment goal should be A, the resolution of abdominal pain, diarrhea, or altered bowel habits, B, endoscopic remission, resolution, resolution of ulcerations on scope, and if you can't reach the area with the scope, on cross-sectional imaging. So many people talk about treat to target, okay? The target may be different by different diseases, but when you're looking at treat to target in Crohn's disease, you want to choose outcomes that make, show that makes a difference, make sure there are objective outcomes, and I gave you examples at the bottom there, endoscopic improvement or healing, histological, radiographic, fecal calprotectin, and C-reactive protein also helpful, but not the top. Now, there's, there's a target for those of you who didn't quite understand what that meant. So, I, in summary, um, Crohn's disease, particularly, and Miguel's going to talk about also the colitis, if you heal the mucosa, you have less need for steroids, you have lower rates of hospitalizations, lower rate of IBD surgery, there is benefits in, tremendous benefits in disability, um, quality of life, potential cost savings, and data I did not cover here because this is really more on the ulcerative colitis side, potential decreased risk for colonic dysplasia and colorectal cancer. I'd like to thank Joel Pico and Dave Rubin, who I stole these slides from. Come to Chicago, DDW, oh, I can't talk about DDW at this meeting. DDW 2020 is in Chicago. Come visit us at the University of Chicago. Thank you very much.